Bogowski. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of... Uh, please tell me, what is it called when a little kid will only talk about themselves and they won't do anything else? And that's why they never ask you how your day is. Doesn't it upset you, Anna? It, I think you have a little bit of a mocking tone on that, Anna. I don't like investing in people if they don't invest in me, Anna, okay? What, what is it called, Anna? Egocentrism. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is it called when I touch a baby's feet and it wiggles and it moves and kicks? <coughs> Rory. So have you watched my video on it? Have you done anything to compensate for it? Mm, likely. What is it? Bailey? Babinski. On your whiteboard, what is it called when um, you touch a baby's cheek and it moves because it's looking for the nipple? I see you. I see you. Put it away. Good. What is it? Marga. Rooting. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is um, it called when a child, uh, what a child can do with a parent and what it can do without a parent. What is that called? It's a Bogowski theme. Yes. Joshua coming strong. What is it? There you go. All right, um, today I'm going to kind of jump around a little bit. Is that okay with you? I have two major experiments that I need to deal with. I would do what I want to do anyway. So we have two major experiments left. Actually, I'm going to go through. I'm going to go through. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. Here we go. All right. Here we go. Language. Let's do it, shall we? Language development. There's stages of language on your study guide. Okay. The first stage of language is cooing. Can anyone make a cooing noise? <laughs> Sound like baby owls. That's essentially what a cooing is. This is the first noise a baby makes, and it's like when they're happy, I guess, right? Yeah, I mean, crying makes sense if they're sad, but that's fine. Okay, so cooing is the first noise a baby makes, and it's like, <laughs> it's like the Pillsbury Doughboy. That's kind of what I think of it. Okay, your second stage is babbling. That is when a little kid looks like he's talking or she's talking, but they actually are making nonsense. And they sit there on like the little cell phones, and they're like, and they're using like letter sounds, but the letters don't mean anything. Have you ever heard a kid do it? I don't know what they actually sound like because I don't hang out with kids. But you know what I mean? Hello? Okay, so that's babbling. They have the sounds of letters. They're just not making sense. Stop, like, I can see you. I, you're making me uncomfortable. Okay, the second, third stage. You need to know this in order, by the way, because there's a question where they say, which of the following are in order? The sec, uh, third stage is one word. It's also known as hollow phrase, and you need to know both. One word is, yes, cookie, now, mommy. Banana. I don't know. Do the kids like bananas? I don't really know. Peas. They don't like peas. I don't know where that one came from, but like cookie. That would be mine. That would be my kid screaming cookie. <laughs> <laughs> Telegraphic speech is short <laughs> sentences with no grammatical corrections. Okay? So they are saying, <clears throat> Mommy, now. Instead of saying, Mother. Please come now. Okay? <laughs> Just like that. Okay, telegraphic speech is they are putting a couple words together which makes sense but are not grammatically correct. So, dog ran, dog runs by. No. That's grammatically correct. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> um, bad Bailey. <laughs> there you go. Um, me hungry now. Uh, what would be another one? <laughs> Telegraphic speech is your last stage before you start making grammatically correct sentences. Okay? So, when you get to about, just before you start entering school, you start doing complete sentences, complete thoughts that are grammatically correct. Everyone good? So, language acquisition is the picking up language. Alright. Temperament is uh, established at birth, 
You're either uh, easy, which means when you were born, your parents said you were a good baby. Everybody is born into one of these three things. And it's born in the first like month, it's very clear. Are you an easy baby, which means your parents could hand you off to any stranger and you would just sit there and coo and like suck on your thumb and just be like, woo. Were you a difficult baby? Which I'm assuming Carly and Bailey were. Irregular, not adaptable, and irritable, which means nothing made you happy. Surprisingly, my sister was the No way. Yeah. Yep. No my way. brother was the hard My sister was the bad and then you have your slow to warm up, which means you need to adjust gradually to change. Uh, that's me. Now, your temperament, you're born with it. So it is innate, and it lays the foundation for your personality. If you are a difficult baby, you're a pain in the butt today. You're very conflict-oriented. You like to dig your heels in, okay? And you have an opinion, and you stand by it, even if you're wrong. That's my brother. No, I'm a slow to warm up. In my own personal life, I'm a slow to warm up. At school, it doesn't. my personality at home does not do a service at school. I'd rather sit in the corner and make sarcastic jokes about people. As a teacher, that's really not that good. So you have to be like an outgoing personality to make it a little bit more engaging to make the information stick. True, not true. Me being sarcastic, sitting in the back, harassing you, is probably not the best way to attack my content. So, my own personal life, I'm slow to warm up, which means I don't really like people, and people don't really like me. Think about it. Even here at Plant High School, there are some people who love me, and there are some people who hate me. I can pretty much tell you everyone who hates me, because I can see it on their face every day. Every day. I have a large collection in my fifth period. So if you'd like to stay around, you'll see them walk in. When they see me, their heart just dies. It's pretty awesome. And I just sit there and smile. All right. But my personality is so to warm up. On your whiteboard, what were you? And if you don't know, ask your parents. But think about the foundation of your personality. Obviously, when you're with your friends, you're different. But overall, in and out, what are you? You. Any difficult? My girl, I like that confidence to so throw that difficult up there. I like it. So to warm up, Aaron, yeah, you are. Yeah, you can't be both. You gotta be difficult, Murray. That's my girl. There's nothing wrong with that, though. You get things done. Not, what? not even anything like if my brother was easy, and he's the difficult one now. And then I'm completely different. Interesting. But I was sick of the video. Oh well, that will deal with it. That that would be it. All right, attachment. So, question. Do you want to look at little babies yes. and be sad? Yes. Or do you want to look at monkeys <coughs> and be sad? Babies. 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 Babies are really sad, though. All right. We're doing an attachment, then. We're going to look at human children who are depressed. Because they have terrible parents. All right. Honestly, I hate, I hate children. <laughs> I don't know if that's been abundantly clear. If it hasn't been abundantly clear, let me be abundantly clear with you. I don't want children. One of the reasons, one of the many reasons, which I keep bringing up to you, is attachment. Attachment is the emotional bond between an infant and the primary caregiver um, measured with Ainsworth's strange situation. So... Ainsworth is the name of the experiment. You need to know this experiment. It is all over your test on Thursday. It will be on your AP exam. And it's all over your mid uh, fi your final exam, by the way. Okay? So it is a big deal. Now, Ainsworth is the chick behind this experiment. We are not going to watch the original Ainsworth footage because she did it in the 1960s, and they redid it in the 80s, and it has a lot more information to it. Does that work for you? Okay, so you need to know Ainsworth. Underneath where it says um, attachment, you need to write Ainsworth. And I would write strange situation because that's the name of the experiment and they refer to it commonly. So in your little box, I would write Ainsworth next to attachment. Strange situation is the name of the experiment. You know how I said you have like about 40 experiments you need just to know flat? 
this is another of the major ones for development. Tomorrow I'm going to do Harry Harlow, which is one of my faves. We're going to terrorize some uh, monkeys, ruin their lives. They're even going to commit suicide, so that's pretty cool. Monkeys can yeah, they can. Yeah, they literally um, bleed themselves. Yeah, attachment, man. That's what does it do. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Also very sad. But we're dealing with attachment now. I told you they're both sad. No, the dog one's sad. Yeah, the dog one's like just The Selman? The Learn How This Is one? She says dogs commit suicide just like walking in the ocean. And then they come out on the shore and they're dead. My dad knew someone who was like kicking Okay, we're going. We're moving on. That's just too sad. All right. Stop it. The water isn't clean. Attachment. All right. So there are different types of attachment. There's four major groups. The first one is secure. Now, for those of you who want to have children at some point, clearly you don't like money. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I don't like children. I have a puppy. That's enough. Anyway, um, if you are a parent, no. When you are a parent in the far, 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 far future, the most important thing that you can do for your child is A, have a secure attachment. If you have a secure attachment with your child, your child has a secure attachment on you, everything else will be easier and better and quality. Okay? It's the most important thing you can do. <coughs> now, when we talk about Ainsworth, it's important to know it doesn't have to be a biological mother, which is why it says caregiver. If, you're, if the baby's caregiver is grandmother, aunt, uncle, foster parents, adoptive parents, it doesn't matter who it is, they just have to be there consistently. So a secure attachment means they're willing to explore and upset. So let me show you the experiment, and I'm going to pause it just like I did yesterday. Does that work for you? All right. Doo -doo -doo. All right. Okay, so Mary Ainsworth's experiment is, <clears throat> is this. They have a room, and it has toys and all that stuff in there. The, the mother and the child goes into the room together, and they are playing. There's a double-sided mirror, which you're going to see here in a few seconds. And the researchers are looking in and watching how the child reacts. Okay? So the mother and the child are going to go in, and they're going to go in and play and stuff like that. When the, do uh, when the experimenter knocks on the window, that is a sign or a trigger for the mom to leave the room. And the mom is going to leave the room for about five minutes. We are looking at the behavior of the child inside the room during that, uh, during that five minutes. <coughs> How do you think they're going to respond? They're going to cry. Okay, so that's important. It's like crying. But the most important part of the experiment is how the child reacts when the mother returns. That is where we discover the attachment. Is it secure, insecure, or uh, detached? Okay? So, the most important thing about this experiment, the mother's in there in the room. They're going to leave. When they come back, that's when we see the attachment. <coughs> this experiment, which I watched through a two-way mirror, is designed to gauge how secure is the crucial relationship between mother and child. This bunny is going to go here, and that bunny will be on top. The value of the test has been established in studies that would watch a child, one-year-old, and then follow it up and interview them about their relationships to their parents when they were 21 years old. So we're quite confident in the long-term significance of this relationship. After several minutes' play, the mother is signaled to leave the room. in the experiment is the child's reaction to her mother's return. 
the important clue is whether the baby's able to become calmed down by the contact with the mother and get back to play. Sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. You see, when the mother was out, she was only interested in the mother, no interest in the toys. Now she has a contact with the mother, she's beginning to show a little interest in the environment, and shortly she'll be right back with the toys where we started. See you. Okay. <clears throat> So, of attachment. So, what happens with this whole experiment? The mother and the child are in the room. They have a knock on the door. The mother leaves. The actual attachment is going to be discovered when the mother walks back in the room. Everyone's clear? What you just saw, when the mother left, what was the child's reaction? Crying. Sad. Ah, it was such, so sad. Okay? So, the mother goes back in. What does the baby do? Walks straight up to the mommy and says, pick me up. As soon as the mother picks her up, doesn't her cries start to slow down? Okay, and within, what, 10, 15 seconds of being up in the mom's arms, she starts getting distracted. That's what you need to write in, the, um, in your application. When the mother arrives, the baby wants to be picked up, consoled, and then wants to go look at things for a secure. For secure attachment, you need to be able to identify. When the mother returns, the baby wants to have contact, okay? and is literally soothed by the contact and then starts getting distracted. To, on Thursday's test, you're going to be reading from the test and there's going to be a scenario and you have to identify it. When you are parents in the far, 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 far future, that's what you want. You want your child to want, be soothed when they come near you and then have the confidence to go ahead and look. You want to see what bad parents look like? All right, so the first type of bad parent is avoidant, okay? Avoidant, let me see, I'm sorry. Okay, perfect, avoidant is the next one. Avoidant is unattached, explore without touching base. What that means is, when the mother is in the room, they're wandering around exploring. Keep in mind, when you see a parent at the park and the kid's playing at the park and the kid isn't playing with the mom, does that mean that's a bad mom? No. When the mother leaves and comes back in, okay, and the kid wants nothing to do with them, is that a bad mom? When the kid's upset? Okay, so I'm going to show you it, and then uh, let's write down, and then um, go through, because this doesn't follow my order specifically. Okay, so avoidant means when the mother comes back in, do the application in a second. When I show you the video, we'll fill those in. Is that fair? Hello? You can do the definitions now, so I'll show you the video and we'll fill in the applications from there. So avoidant means when the mother comes back in the room, they want nothing to do with the mother. Okay? Ambivalent is insecurely attached, upset when mother leaves, and then angry with the mother when she returns. Hostile, aggressive towards the mother. And disorganized, disoriented, they are, that means these kids are sometimes abused or neglected. They're fearful, dazed, and completely and depressed. They have essentially no reaction. They just stare off in space. When I show you it, we'll talk about a little bit more of what causes things. That way you can see that kind of a visual. Now when you go to a grocery store, and you see a little kid crying at the store, and you see the mother trying to soothe it, should you say, oh my god, that's a bad mom? No, no, there's lots of things that cause that. If the mother is taken away, and the babe mom comes back, and the kid is still screaming and hostile, you'd be like, damn, bad mom. But if, if, if you're at Publix, and there's a crying baby on the next aisle, you can't just say, oh my god, it's an insecure attachment, oh my god. Don't do that, that's not fair. Because some days, kids just have bad days. I don't know about you, but sometimes I just want to cry at Publix, too. All right, here we go. What? No. Good call this a secure one. Yes. yes. It's certainly much heavier. Okay, so the Close to the door following her. Now, we, we sent the mother right back in, but the point here is not to distress the baby. We're just trying to challenge it. The baby puts her hands to her face, a sad expression, puts her face down. 
when she picks her up, she keeps her head down, her arms out, and then she sits in the chair holding the baby. The baby's still sullen. He's low-keyed. So you would call this insecure Yes, attention. insecure. He's avoidant. He's, he's... Okay, let me show you what avoidant looks like again. So, when the mother leaves the room, and this is what you should be writing in your thing. When the mother leaves the room, not this Most of the door following her. Okay. So, when the mother leaves, what is the baby's response? Oops. Crying and upset. When the mother comes back in, this is avoidant, by the way. When the mother comes back in, how does the child respond? Who can raise your hand and tell me how the child responds? Ellie? Distant. Completely distant. Literally doing whatever they can. Because obviously, can the baby push the mom away? No. What he does is he stares down, literally does not hold her, just sits there and acts depressed. No, we, we sent the mother right back in. But the point here is not to distress the baby. We're just trying to challenge it. The baby... Puts her hands to her face in a sad expression. Puts her face down. When she picks her up, she keeps her head down, her arms out. And then she sits in the chair holding the baby. The baby's still sullen. He's low-keyed. So you would call the, this insecure Yes, attention. insecure. He's avoidant. He's, he's not engaging her, and it's not being, the reunion's not effective. And it's important to remember here that the thing that upset him was her absence. Her, re her return should be the solution to his problem. Okay, so what that means is, is that that mother is a non-involved mother, which means that child has to self-soothe on a regular basis, which means the mother is not seen as a happy point of his existence. That in order to have happiness, it is essentially not given from the mom. Is that not the saddest thing you've ever heard? <coughs> so sad. What? Yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. Like, so you can have a secure and insecure depending on the family members and stuff like that. This one is being tested on this one. Hopefully this kid, this kid has a secure attachment to someone because that allows you to develop intellectually, physiologically, all this other stuff. It has an effect on every component, which is why it's such a big deal. Um, hopefully he's maybe attached, securely attached to his father, an aunt, a foster, or whoever, but he does not attach securely to his mother, or whoever this chick is, yes. If they were attached to someone like their father, would it bleed into it? No, it's typically isolated. Just like when you think about your relationship with your parents, okay? You have thoughts about your mom. Mine at your age were not positive. And I adore my father. I still adore my dad. He's fantastic. So cute. Um, okay, they keep them separate. Kids keep them separate too. They understand that. Okay, so you ready to be depressed even more? Yes. This chick. This chick. This is another pattern that we see in babies who are not good at using their mother as a secure base at home. This baby is also insecure. But you'll see, we got a look at his play before the separation. The mother's left. When she returns, she picks him up. He can't calm down. He's still upset. She offers a toy to amuse him or to comfort him or to distract him, and he slaps it away. She offers another. He slaps it away. He's angry. He's, he's, we call these babies resistant or ambivalent because they both want her back and yet can't use the contact. We think that the difficulty is that in the past, when he sought comfort, she's been inconsistent as to whether she's available and responsive or not. Okay. When you have, in this, I would describe it, when the mother returns, the kid is hostile is aggressive, unsoothable, even with contact, cannot soothe. When you talk about ambivalent, these are kids who are straight up neglected emotionally. Okay, the mother is spotting here and there, and the child hasn't, uh, they're around enough that the child depends, but there's not the trust that they're gonna come back. Like for instance, my Toby, okay? 
when he was a puppy, when we put him in his kennel, okay, he freaks out, being like, oh my god, I'm going to die here, they're going to forget me. Now, he crawls into his kennel, and he loves getting his little treats when he goes in, and he sits down, and he nestles in, even before I cover him with his little blanket. He knows I'm coming back to get him. There's that trust there. Does that make sense? When you are a little kid, as babies, when parents leave, they believe their parents are dying, which is why they're crying. But then eventually that trust and that relationship gets built with the belief that that parent is coming back. When you have an ambivalent attachment, that trust is not there. They don't believe you're coming back. And when you are four, five, six, seven years old, imagine what that kid has experienced to make him feel that way. Isn't that heartbreaking? That they don't have the basic trust that whoever is caring for them is coming back. And that's because they have not been consistent. Now, this kid may not live with his mom, or his mom may just be doing whatever his mom's doing, but he may have a secure attachment with someone else, but with his mom, he is it. Ambivalent one. Yes? Did it change? No. So once it's... Once it's done, it's done. Think about it. Aren't you... There's something your parents have done. Hopefully, none of to this level. Can we agree? That have you hold on to it? Have you put it in the back of your head and you'll never really forgive it? Kind of? Hopefully that's not true. But there's something that's happened. Something that you know has happened in your family that you've stuck in the back of your head and you... It's shaping kind of your relationship. Yes? Imagine the fundamental foundation of your relationship is being trust, and your parents don't have that. You don't have that trust for your parents. You'll never recover. Like, McCray does not have a good relationship with his father since the moment he was born. Ambivalent attachment. Still to this day, when his, a uh, non-ambivalent attachment, he is uh, avoided. When he's with his dad, he just, like, stares down at the ground, yes sir, no sir, just completely detached. It's been that way since he was a little kid. He was terrified of his father. Terrified. So I'm so glad he's coming for Christmas. Shoot me in the face. <laughs> but that would be, it follows. It has affected his entire relationship. There's no way that him and his dad are going to be BFFs. You know what I mean? But he has a very secure attachment with his mom. He has a great relationship with his stepdad. He has a great relationship with my dad, so it kind of compensates. Does that make sense? But I will tell you right now, my, my McCray has never gotten over that he doesn't have a relationship with his father. It will affect you. Your parenting will affect your child. Think about your parents. And your parents are, I'm, everyone has great parents. Think of how your parents have affected you and how you've already sworn. I'm never doing that with my kids. How many times have you said that? So many. Okay. There you go. Are we depressed yet? Oh, I, that was the end of my video. Disorganized, disoriented. Uh, what that looks like, um, the kid, when the mother is in the room, this is, your, um, uh, this is your application. When the mother is in the room, the baby wants nothing to do with her. When the mother leaves, the baby does not notice. When the mother re-enters, the baby does not notice. This is um, your disorient, organized disoriented. There is no reaction with coming, going, or leaving. This is straight up abuse children. There is no relationship except fear. What? He's like, um, let's say like a 12 year old, and he gets like a stepdad, and you get these same responses with this new one. No, you're going to be shamed. To a degree. Like, for instance, McCray does not have, he has something with his dad. I wouldn't call it a relationship, but there's communication. I don't, you, you, know, you know, it's not there. Um, him and his stepdad are really close. Like, McCray, like, we've been going through, like, a bunch of things the last couple weeks. And McCray calls Sunshine, or his stepdad. Calls, 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 calls. They're really close. I will tell you right now, if his dad called and said, hey, son, let's go do this, McCray will drop off a clip because he wants that relationship. Does that make sense? You can't compensate. Like, he'll do whatever. He adores his... He wants a relationship with his dad so much, he would do anything for him. Even to his own demise. You know? It's really sad. It is sad. But, no. 
you can't. If you don't have a secure attachment when you're a child, you're always going to be drawn from it. Now, is McRae living a successful, happy life? Yes. Is that the, one of the biggest things in his life that he would love to change and he would do anything to change it? Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. Everything that happens to you is going to affect you in some way, Hunter. That's scary. It is scary. And that's why parenting is really scary. Well, because my, um, my cousin's having a baby. Uh, I think she's due December 16th or something like that. Uh-huh. And we, I was at, um, for Thanksgiving. Are they going to be good parents? Yeah, for like Thanksgiving, I was, uh, I went over and she was there and I was just like telling her all the stuff that I learned in here, like all the, mm-hmm. it's like all the development and stuff like that. And she like, she said what she was going to do is not have, or one of the things she was going to do is not have any, uh, electronics in the, in the house for the baby. So everything's like. That's good. My friend Brittany did that for a very long time. Yeah. Where it's just like, you know, it's all learning and. Feeling and playing. So yeah. said even the toys like are all going to be manually kept to move. So like no electronic. Yeah, like, that's great. Yeah. That's great. At least they're aware of it. Yeah. So I mean, I wonder how long it's going to last out as like grown ups. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> like living in a complete bubble. That'd yeah. be crazy. But yeah, I mean, they're at least aware of it and they at least kind of know. That's the best thing you can try. You you, you need to try. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. I, I push it. Okay. Do you think like talking? I've heard that. Um, if, like, people would talk to their like, 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 so kids who grow up in a home where they're not hearing all the language when they get to oh, school, like that. <laughs> they're already something in their mind, and they're not used to normal uh, sentence structure, they're not used to normal cadence, and stuff like that, which is why they show up in the disadvantage. Um, there are a few situations that have happened more worse is that they're like, you can't like, sue some of the kids too much like you can get the more stimulus that you have um, where it's actually thought it's more like that the faster their neural connection the reason why a lot of scientists say that technology is so bad is because watching TV is a very passive thing while reading is not so they're saying that our neural impulses aren't working as fast as other people. So it's just about exposing them. And um, exposing them as well as you know, getting that uh, foundation of the
looking up through a window. <laughs> you know, I mean, what would that really look like? I mean, I would be upset too. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So it's over a consistent variable. Um, so that would be the only thing. Do you really want to know? Probably not. I, I wouldn't think so. You're thinking that this is something that needs to be, like, you should know. I don't think you want to know. Because that's oh my god, my uh, sister right, is a terrible mother. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's not something you want to know. You want to do. Probably not. Do. Um, so, like, that's what I'm... I was, if you're interested in seeing... I would look at the original experiments and you can replicate the original experiment to a more elastic factory. Just by having whoever leave the room and then come back into the room to see how the baby responds, it would be a very cheap way to destroy whatever parenting <laughs> of the person you're doing. I think they deserve a better yeah. you know, end of the deal before you say, oh my god, you ruined your child. You're never going to recover and Shame. Yeah, better. exactly. You can't shame them on one experience. Right. You'd have to set it up. I probably so. wouldn't tell them. Like, no, you wouldn't. <laughs> but oh my god. But then knowing in your head that they have an ambivalent or, you know, that would be, and I would feel like I'd have to step in and do something. And would you be able to do that? So is it better to leave it alone or just... Oh, yeah. It is. Less guilt on one. How are you? We're talking about bad parenting today. Bad parenting. That's why I'm never having children. Yes, she no, I'm not. Like, come on, you and McCray would be like the cutest little fans. No. We have a puppy, and he's pretty dead. No, but like your Christmas card would be complete for that. <laughs> um, we are already working on our Christmas card, and it's going to be boss. So, it's supposed to be my year to plan the Christmas card, so it's going to be like super sweet and cute, and McCray has decided I got it. So I'm sick. I really can't take full breaths. But that's okay. I gotta get through. We have a lot to cover. Okay. It's Tuesday. Tuesday's rose. It's all on the board, people. Tuesday's just like a bad day. By the way, week 19. From a day of the world. Tuesday's just an annoying day. It's like, yeah, you're just gonna like lunch. Wednesday was like. Two notes, too. Go away. Yeah, I'm bored. Tuesday's just like a busy day. Go Week 19 is with Matteo Richie. Everyone else is on the board in the first column. I don't know every year. I just need Matteo Richie, week 19. Oh. I'm going to keep saying week 19. I'm trying to help a girl out here. <laughs> right. Lee. Matteo Richie. I like your hair. What did you do different? Uh, I don't know. It looks nice. It looks different. You always look nice. So it looks different. <laughs> yeah. I can wipe it clean if you like. Yeah, that'd be not good. <laughs> See, Rip keeps confident. He doesn't need it. I personally don't care. I've never used the board. Yeah. My man! Well, I couldn't read it. So. Wow. Yeah, I can't, I can't read it. Perfect. Yeah, but... I can't read it. I got through to Quasi Divine Emperor yesterday. Charlotte, how was your break? Good. Didn't you just get, you were here yesterday, right? I was not. You're living life? I was in the mountain. Oh my god. What mountain? Not in Tennessee, I hope. Because those things are up in flames. Yeah. Dolly, Dollywood has been hit, people. Seriously? I've never been to Dollywood, and I personally, like Gatlinburg, Tennessee, or whatever it is. What is it? Gatlinburg. Gatlinburg. Yeah. Apparently, it's just been burned to the ground, and that's my step, uh, my uh, father-in-law's favorite place in the whole wide world. Yeah, I Just been burned down. I was in, like, North Carolina, like, western North Carolina, like, two weeks ago. The whole sky was, like, smoke, and, like, the, the sun was, like, right red. It was, like, the devil was the ball. That's the scariest thing. 
<coughs> so what mountains were you in, Charlotte? Um, North Carolina, like Hatcher, Hatcher area. Thanks. Week 19. He's at the bottom. Did you find him? Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm Because I'm like, just oh my god, how have you, you not found you? it? Seconds. Oh, you got to train grade, man. Oh, got to train grade. So whoever that is, wrong. Okay. Who wants to find Yongle? Jared. Uh, he was a predecessor of Hongwu, and he used sea explorations uh, to gather culture and move the capital to Beijing to avoid capture. Okay. Who wants to do Emperor? Emperor Hongwu. Call on them. They all should have it. Grab yourself a skit, uh, quiz sheet, please. How talented you are. I didn't know you were such a big deal. I mean, I knew, sort of, but. See you, darling. Yeah. 
answers. Got ten seconds. You either know or you don't. Why don't you go back to the four piece? Yes, no problem. Three, two, one. Time's up. All right, your bonus question. Today has a nickname. What is today? Today has a nickname. What is today? All right, it's not as famous as like Black Friday, but it's a thing. All right, Training Grade, you either know or you don't. Glad you're here, John. Training Grade, let's go. You either know it or you don't. It doesn't matter. Here we go. Who got them all right? <laughs> All right, it was Riley's. All right, here we go, Dom. All right, number 11. We parked in this Can we do one? One. Just translate it to one. Okay. One, we parked in this zone. 12, zero bell. 13, triangular trade. 14, transatlantic slave trade. 15, slave trade in Eastern and Southern Africa. 16, the effects of slavery in Africa. 17, Colombian exchange. 18 factor, 19 northwest passage, 20 British East India. There you go. All right, and the bonus is what is it, Riley? Oh, I wish, but no. No, it is um, Giving Tuesday. It's the largest day of charitable donations around the world. What do you got, Courtney? Did they put it in the East and the British East? No. All right, total up for the day. Please pass them. Please pass your quizzes to Thompson. George is getting your map. John is getting your primary. Thompson, you do not need to put them in order. George and John, I do need it, please. Ricky, help a girl out. So you'll help Courtney. You're not going to help Caroline. Help Caroline. Take the quizzes out of her hand. There you go. See? Everyone should have their notebook out. Everyone should have their whiteboard out. It's only week 16. Only week 16. Looking right at you, Sue. You've got to be kidding. Yeah. Don did it, too. <laughs> Gentlemen, what week is it? Okay, just want to make sure we're all on the same page here. Grace, what week is this? 16. I've done the same thing, 16 weeks. I'm a creature of habit. Every Tuesday, Wednesday, guess what we get? Every Tuesday, Wednesday. Yeah, I thought it was good. All right, here we go. On your whiteboard, please tell me, what is the name of the dynasty that's going to overthrow the Mongols? What is it, Abby? On your whiteboard, please tell me who's the founder of the bank. Founder of the Ming. What the hell is that? That looks, like, that looks like a thing. What is it, Kaylin? Hong Wu. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the people Hong Wu sent around to ensure that the government was being fair. They're also delicious little oranges. 
What are they, Sylvia? Mandarin. That's the only one. Oh, that's Mandarin. Yes. Yeah. 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 That's what you got in like your little Chinese stuff. <laughs> 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 Just go with the Chinese thing. Anyway, fine. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the gentleman who moved the capital of China to its current location. Good, Grace. Yongle. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the capital of China and its nickname. You need to have two things on your boards, people. There's two things on your boards. Good. What is it, Brenna? Um, Beijing and the Forbidden City. Forbidden City. Would you want to see Beijing in the Forbidden City? Yeah. yeah. It's really cool. Once the, especially with the Communist Revolution, it's now called Red Square. Modeled after the Russians, of course. It's really cool. Tiananmen Square. Any of that? No? You heard of that? Yeah. All right. Would you want to go? Yeah. I would want to go, but I would need someone to like hold my hand. Over like, I would go to so many people. It's like a spin one. So I'm thinking about trying to get Ren to do it next year. I want to go to China. He's doing Paris. Paris. Yeah. Okay, if you want to go to Paris next year. <laughs> One day I'll go to China. McCray said he'll never go to China. That's just the Huh? <laughs> I'm not that poor. Ren knows I'm not. I would love to go to China. But McCray's like, I'd rather go to places. He wants to go to Atlanta Beach somewhere. Here we go. I know. He's challenging. He's cute, though, so we can do it. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of the invaders who defeated the Ming? What are the name of the invaders, not their dynasty? Good. Thompson. Manchu. On your whiteboard, please tell me what is the name of... Uh, please tell me what are two reasons why the Ming fell. Give me two reasons why the Ming fell. First of all, one of them is a great reason. If I get killed, I want to die this way. And what is one of... Uh, ooh, what do we got? Caitlin. Um, pirates and peasant revolt. All right, I don't want to die by a peasant revolt, but pirates are pretty cool. All right, what's another way? Peasant and pirates are cool. Like, come on. Yeah. Will, give me two more. Uh, the famine. Okay. Yeah, oh, who's my, what's another one, Grace? Secluded emperors. Secluded emperors, which means they aren't getting the information they need. Charlotte. The, the, the what? The Mandarins? No, Unix. Unix. Do you know what a Unix is? Yes. What are they? Yeah, they cut off their testicles very early on in life, so that way they're not distracted by women. So they can focus on their job. That's dedication. So, it's a Unix. They're going to have tons of those. They have a lot of those running around. What else? <laughs> I was going to say something else, but I decided not to. I don't know where we left off. I'm moving on. On your whiteboard, what is the name of the gentleman who is the most important ruler of uh, the chain? Good. No, he's not the most important. No, he's not the most important. Who is it? Thompson. Chien Long. On your whiteboard, what is something really cool that Chien Long does that practically never occurs in history? Which is pretty cool. If the U.S. government could do that this year, I have six grand. That would be boss. And what is it, Nathaniel? Yeah, they make so much money they don't need taxes anymore. U.S. government. How about me? All right, here we go. Uh, you can raise your hand and tell me where we left off. Will. Angzi, here we go. All right, so the Qing Empire, they are a military empire. Look how much land they conquer. They're going to conquer a ton of places. Okay, so when the Qing come into power, they are going to forbid intermarriage with the Chinese. The Mongols and the Manchus are the only two conquering powers in China. Manchus, Mongols, two M's, that's a nice for China does make it easier to remember. They have the little dynasties, they keep things in Ah, because it's awesome. Um, anyway, so they have two empower and uh, two major powers. Now as I go through, 
um, your Manchu or your Qing. I'm going to be making comparisons between the Mongols and that. Biggest thing about the Manchus and the Mongols, they both ban in intermarriage. You're not allowed to mix. You're not allowed to study the, lo uh, the official language. And um, Manchu have a hairstyle. We talked about this, right? You Googled it. It's pretty awesome. I think we should make it a thing here at Plain High School. I'm just going to push for it, but I feel like that's going to be ignored. All right, um, Emperor's Kangzi, sure, whatever. He's a Confucian scholar and poet. Why is that different than the Mongols' predecessors? Abby? Because the Mongols didn't have, they were kind of like forced out um, Confucian scholars. And, like, okay, the Mongols do not support any of the Confucian, any of the Chinese stuff. They don't want it. They literally kind of turn their back to all the education. The Qing are going to have the largest educationally based empire in the history of China. It's going to be a good thing and a bad thing, but they're going to have the largest one. That makes the Manchus a little uh, different. They're going to conquer Taiwan, Tibet, and Central Asia. And Quan Long is going to be the most important one. He's going to delete taxes, and he's going to be the cultural high. All right. <clears throat> um, civil service exam comes back under the Ming. The Qing are going to make, expand it. The biggest change under the Qing is they're going to add history and literature. Okay, so underneath the Qing Empire, they are going to add uh, history and language, uh, history and literature. Now, we've talked about the civil service exam. I'm just going to remind you because it's again on your midterm. There's like four or five questions about it. Um, the civil service exam is a three-day exam. Okay, anyone can take the test. Up until the Qing Empire, even women could take it. You weren't going to get the best jobs, but you could get a government job. Okay? Up until the Qing. The Qing are a super patriarchal society. They're not going to have any women taking the exam. Okay? So you go up, you show up for three days. It takes three days. There's no bathroom breaks. There's no sleeping breaks. You sleep. You use the pot in the room. You bring your own supplies, and you sit there, and you write, and you take the test. Um, <clears throat> apparently, in your book, it goes into great detail that if you die during civil service, they throw you over a wall. My first period was fascinated. They were fascinated anymore. Um, a lot of people uh, didn't eat correctly before, and then, or didn't drink enough water and stuff like that, and they didn't bring enough stuff. Because you literally get the door locked, and then you're forced out when the thing opens. <coughs> okay? Under the Qing, you're going to have more people than ever taking the exam which means it's going to be super, super competitive, which means cheating is going to be a huge thing. When things get super, super competitive, people start cheating. Um, one of the other things that's going to happen is that so many people are going to have college educations that there's not enough government jobs. There's going to be about a million people with a degree and only about 20,000 government jobs. So all of a sudden, if you have a college degree, do you want to go work in a rice field? No, so you're going to try to get an give an education because you have an education, so you're going to start tutoring. Is that a good thing or a bad thing for the rest of society? It's a good thing. That means you're educating people who typically wouldn't be educated. So all of a sudden we have this huge class of educated who are going to be tutoring other people. Yes, John? So if they tutor, wouldn't that create more sponsors? Well, yes, John. That hasn't been that yeah, conflict yet. Why would that be a turmoil for the jobs in government? Because there's even more people that... Yeah, but then the jobs are going to be filled by even more capable people, which means government's going to run more effectively. But people are going to be frustrated with their menial jobs, which is currently what's happening in China and is currently happening here in the United States. Because we have too many people with high college diplomas who aren't getting jobs to pay for their college loans. Yes? We know people who have gone four years to university and can't get a good job. Okay, so people are frustrated and stuff like that, and we're starting to see that here, too. Um, <clears throat> what you're going to have is opportunity for social mobility, all that stuff. So, social service exam is back. The biggest problem with it is it's going to cause a lot of chaos just because a lot of people, there's going to be less people out farming. If there's less people farming, guess what? Less food. All right, patriarchal society. I don't think I have to tell you that China is a patriarchal society, do I? It's going to get worse, though. All the sons favored. We have infanticide, which we're going to kill off um, firstborn women in order to get a firstborn male. Uh, ladies, when you marry, you no longer belong to your parents. You now belong to your husband's family. That's why you have a dowry. Engagement rings, that's a dowry. That's a Western thing. 
essentially when your fiance gives you a diamond ring, it's um, he bought you. <laughs> Apparently I'm worth kind of good, pretty good amount. Yeah. yeah, they did. In a lot of places all around the world, cows have more value than a stupid rock. Yeah. So they bought cows and goats and sheep and stuff. It still happens. <laughs> Uh, men control divorce. This is something interesting under the Qing. Under the Qing, men are allowed to divorce. Okay? <clears throat> men, gentlemen, you can divorce your wife for cheating on you. Makes sense. Or for talking too much. And everything in between. There's a primary source I almost made you read, but there's really no academic value of a bunch of complaints and reasons why men filed for divorce. A lot of the complaints are that their wives got too fat. And that they weren't as pretty as they thought on their wedding day. Because a lot of people meet on their wedding day. And uh, they aren't actually that pretty. So, now in a patriarchal society, can men re uh, remarry? Yeah, of course they can. Women, can ladies, can we remarry? No, we're essentially supposed to walk into the woods and live in the woods until we die. I guess I don't really know. We're supposed to just remove ourselves from society. So that's good. What are you doing in the woods? I don't know. If a bunch of women are out in the woods, we could have a good time, right? No. All right. Yes. Foot binding is back, obviously, because we're in a patriarchal society. Yes. Why would women want to walk? You know, we can just sit around all day, I guess. Anyway, so patriarchal society, we got um, foot binding is back. Women are going to do it. We've already seen the pictures of that. Do we need to look at those pictures again? No. I don't think so. All right. American food is showing up in China. Obviously, we're in four, so four has the Columbia Exchange open. You need to know the new food crops, corn, sweet potato, and peanuts, led to a population increase in China, just like it has done in every other part of the world, except for in the Americas, where population obviously decreases. China is receiving corn, sweet potato, and peanuts. It is going to lead to a population increase. However, there's a lot of rebellions and famines, which means the population is decreasing. And even though the population increases because of food, because of the decrease of rebellion, it stays stagnant. So we're killing more people, like we're killing enough to balance it out, I guess. So that's good. Um, so there you go. Uh, one of the other big things is foreign trade. Now, lacquerware. Have you ever seen like black Chinese <coughs> pots that have like these really pretty floral, draw uh, floral things that are like bright colors? If you don't know what I'm talking about, Google lacquerware. Um, it's really pretty pottery kind of thing. Instead of having like the cracked pottery like you typically think of, it's just really pretty kind of like glass, plasticky. Google it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just Google it. Um, <coughs> that is going to be invented in the Ming. And that's why Ming, uh, porcelain, Ming, all of their stuff is super expensive because they're the first ones to do it. Um, that's going to be the huge price item that's going to be coming out during this time, this new technology, which is really not a technology. Silk, porcelain, and tea are obviously the traditional things. Um, you're also going to, the biggest thing you need to understand is that China only wants silver bullion. They only want silver bullion. They only want silver bullion, which means you can sell them to them in bars, you can give them to them in coins. They don't care how they get it. They just want it. This is going to completely destroy their economy in period five. Silver and opium are going to completely destroy China, but silver is going to be the major cause, which makes them desperate. And then if you're desperate, you're stressed, so you need opium, you know, take off the edge. So, you know, yes. Um, they use it for decorating. They love it. Just like today, how they're in the largest importers of ivory, they decorate with it. Yeah. Um, Yongle. We're fine on that. Uh, Chinese merchants are trading. Tang, Song, do, 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 do. Um, during the Ming and Qing, no science or technology is really being pushed at all. They're at a complete standstill. So when we get to period five, China's going to be conquered. Okay? They're going to be conquered and divided by Europeans because they don't have the technology. And that's a big reason why. So Ming and Qing aren't doing science. Uh, they're ch focusing on China's past, nothing else. There's three classes, which you should be, there's a rich, the middle class, and then the poor. No surprise there. Uh, Neo-Confucianism is going to be the blend of Confucianism and Buddhism in China. There's Neo-Confucianism in Japan, which is different. You need to make sure you know the difference between them. Uh, Yangle Encyclopedia, we've talked about. See ya. And then as soon as we get back, we'll do Christianity, and then we are to boards, then Japan. Which is hard. Bye-bye.
<clears throat> so I checked the box for some years. So. Sure. What? The fiction. Go eat lunch. Okay. I'm not going to put it in the computer right now anyway. So... 